This season I have experimented with how close together I could plant salad greens to maximize my space. And indeed I had escarole, lettuce, arugula and kale growing packed together to the millimeter. As time passed, the plants flowered after I had enjoyed several harvests from them as cut and come again greens. While they had been very abundant up until now, I knew that as summer rolled in, I would need to plant something else if I wanted a succession of growth. So I decided to plant summer squash as an experiment. This experimental bed has produced a lot of lettuce and greens and kale. Now it's time for me to plant something else. Things have gone to seed and I'm still a little bit hesitant about taking them. I almost want to save the seed since they're already setting the seed, the arugula. But I'm going to cut all the lettuce out or the escarole out to plant some squash. That way a summer crop will succeed a spring or winter crop. That's a way of making the soil produce more in a limited amount of space. But before I completely take out, especially the flowering arugula, I'm gonna let it sprout first because I don't want the soil to be bereft of any living plant. So I'm gonna direct seed it, which I usually don't. And I'm gonna try it out, putting more seed obviously and I'll probably have to thin it out, which I don't like to do, but gotta do it. Now I'm removing the whole plant with the lettuces. They've grown spindly, they're about to set seed, yet they're still surprisingly tender to eat. So it's a good harvest. I'm doing it in the morning because that way there's less chance of it wilting. You don't want to harvest lettuce after the morning, especially during summer. Now this is actually escarole, so it's in the chicory family, and or endive actually. There are many names for it. And if it's still tender, it can be eaten, it can be cooked if you want to, but I prefer to eat it as salad. Sometimes you do have to be ruthless and practical in trying to maximize your food production in a smaller garden. Leggy heads of chicory would never be found in a grocery store, simply due to the industry standard compact head requirement. There is nothing wrong with these, they just had to compete more for light because of the tight space they had to develop in. That is the good thing about home gardens, we get to be more respectful of the resources we have at hand. A gardener doesn't think twice before consuming an ugly vegetable growing at home, whereas we tend to be very picky with appearances when choosing produce in a supermarket. Even if we have been fooled many times by beautiful and shiny supermarket veggies that happen to be utterly tasteless. A few days after sowing the squash, the seedlings were already breaking soil. I see that the squash has sprouted and it's starting to wanting to be leggy and I don't want that to happen so I'm going to start pruning these and chopping and dropping. That way the fertility is kept in the soil, the soil always has something growing in it and that will feed the soil microbes. More and more I'm using chop and drop as a practice in my garden. I think it makes sense in several levels. It primarily makes sense because it emulates a forest, a natural system. By chopping and dropping I clear the space and fertilize the soil all at once. More and more I feel that hauling material back and forth to create a compost pile Having to turn it, hauling it back, can just be simplified by cutting access material on the spot and leaving it to decompose there. It is much more efficient. I have not done it enough to conclusively say that this is the only way to go or the best way to go, but I like where this is taking me. It is so intuitive and simple that one wonders, what's the catch? There may be none, after all, that is how forests work, it just makes intuitive sense. Perhaps I will continue to add extra materials like grass clippings to boost fertility for intensive cultivation, but copying nature cycles seem to be the way to go. Coming up in the next block, will my squash flourish or will I be bitterly disappointed right after this commercial?
If you enjoy the videos and would like to support the channel, you can purchase an original painting or drawing in my Etsy shop, or become a patron in my Patreon. A couple of weeks later, the squash seedlings had grown substantially. I was hoping they were about to zoom up in growth, as plants usually do when they find the right conditions. Some faster growing giant sunflowers were beginning to cast shadow, however, and that made me apprehensive. Nonetheless, I decided to plant more summer squash in a different sunnier location near the grapevines. I usually end up forgetting to plant squash, so this time I'm starting it Maybe a little bit um, later than I would like to, but this is a Black Beauty zucchini and it says it's 48 days, so I should expect it by the middle of July. Let's see how that works. Usually I have problems with pests. Sometimes I have squash bugs destroy the whole plant and they die. I want to see if I have better luck with this one. While I am usually able to grow abundantly following organic methods, there have been a few insect pests that carry some diseases that have been my nemesis. Squash bugs and harlequin bugs usually end up cutting my growing season short and I have yet to find a really effective way to control them organically, besides using neem oil. I was growing this summer squash directly from seed. These beds had been covered with cardboard and a layer of grass clipping mulch. I just had to pierce through the cardboard and deposit a seed hoping that they would come up through the holes and grow into productive vines. I usually prefer to grow in cups first and then transplant them into the garden because it is a way of maximizing my growing season. It also protects the plants when they are the most fragile by having them in a controlled environment indoors. Domesticated plants are very much prone to many pests. It seems like everything likes to eat them. When you plant them in cups earlier, you give your plants a leg up as they develop. Squash is one of those plants that are either a hit or miss. When they decide to grow, nothing can stop them, and they flood you with produce. But if conditions are a bit less than ideal, it seems like they become very prone to pests and diseases. I do know I don't have enough direct sun exposure to effortlessly grow squashes, but I always try anyways. A couple of weeks later, they were showing a lot of promise. In fact, my last batch sown had surpassed my earlier planted squash in growth. But then the worst happened. Squash bugs attacked the first batch of squash I had planted. Between that and the shading, I knew they were not gonna survive for long. I had the unfortunate discovery this morning that squash bugs have attacked this squash here. This squash has stunted and I, I suppose it might be because everything around it grew so tall and fast like these sunflowers. And for some reason it never leapfrogged. There's a point where plants, for some reason they, I don't know, they may find the right microbiome in the soil or for some other strange reason we don't know they just leapfrog in their growth this never happened to this squash here and there are other squash plants over there which are actually doing better and now i see all the squash bug which will completely destroy it in a few days now it seems that these squash bugs come after plants that are already weakened to kind of take them out that's kind of unfortunate i'll try to control it but i doubt i'm gonna get anything out of this once these bugs attack, they suck the life out of the plant. You can control them by spraying soapy water, but I feel like they usually attack plants that are failing anyways. But there was something else bothering me about the garden this year. It's been a kind of crazy season of extremes. We've had some drought in the beginning and then a lot of rain, and I had some things go crazy and grow while take over the garden while other things completely were destroyed either by too much rain or by the other plants that were engulfing it or even by the groundhog that attacked it. But one thing that's been happening is that there's been so many mosquitoes, it's kind of impossible to stand still for too long or to be in the garden for too long. 
and with the threat of West Nile virus around here in Maryland, it's just not a good idea. Even mosquito repellents, they're just not working very well. So I can barely get my harvest without being completely flooded with mosquitoes. It's not the best of summers, I would say, even though some things have grown spectacularly. Still, there's no enjoyment of being shut out from your garden when mosquitoes just dominate everything. Indeed, it was a season of extremes. The squash planted in the sunnier spot was showing much more promise, pumping out darker, larger leaves. I had protected them from the groundhog with some cages, but I didn't secure them well enough to the ground. Long story short, the groundhog ended up attacking some of the squashes, the best ones as usual. It also rained a lot, and mushrooms were popping up everywhere accompanied by hordes of mosquitoes. Then Mexican beetles attacked the squash, finally destroying the vines. By then, I had given up already. The season was growing to a close, and I really could not stand outside for too long. All the humidity in our muggy Maryland summers was not helping. In the end, I didn't get any squash, just dead vines. But I did get hopeful that maybe next year, things would be different.